All right, good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about how the um, tools that uh, we're using in the interop space and RevStack projects can help us to identify does a tool or a specific application work on an OpenStack-based cloud. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in that space in the last uh, years, and we have some ideas how to move this forward. And we want to talk to you about these and present them. Um, maybe, Catherine, you introduce yourself. Oh, hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, I am Catherine Diff. I work for IBM, and uh, currently I am the PTL of the RevStack project. Hi, I'm Chris Hodge from the OpenStack Foundation, and um, I also work, I work on OpenStack interoperability and um, uh, administer the interoperability program for the foundation. I'm Kurt Galloff from T-Systems. Um, we run Open Telecom Cloud, which is a public cloud based on OpenStack. And uh, working with a knowledge probability as one of the, the pieces where we have uh, first uh, uh, started to uh, support the, the project and the community with, uh, with our contributions. Um, I've been in the OpenStack community for, for a bit of time. We started 2011, actually, with our first uh, OpenStack work. So uh, it's been fun and a nice ride since then. Um, good. Um, one remark. Uh, the unfortunate thing we found out is there's another interop-related session in a room <laughs> close by. So probably we only have half of the audience that we would like to see here. Um, but then there's also an interrupt working group meeting tomorrow morning. Was right. it nine? Yeah, tomorrow morning, I think at nine o'clock, we're going to have um, the interoperability working group is going to be um, getting together, um, planning issues for the next um, that we're going to be working on for the next few months, and um, you know working on some of the things that we're going to be talking about in in this session today. So if you're interested in that, um, please feel free to join. Also, these sessions are being recorded, so um, if you're interested to see what's happening in the session next door, you can, you'll be able to find that um, online um, pretty soon. Good. Well, let's, let's get started. So um, talking about interoperability, um, let's look and understand on the problem we're trying to solve. Um, on the left side, I tried, of, uh, tried to become artistic, <laughs> do a little drawing of the problem that some other clouds are having to solve. Let's call it the orange cloud. Um, there's one big public cloud, a number of regions maybe, but uh, one big public cloud. And uh, many users, of course, as users come with different expectations and needs, uh, but they're all talking to the same APIs, to the same clouds, the same installation managed by the same company. Um, they have some challenges as well because not all regions have the same list of services, but I mean, that's a, still a simple, still a pretty simple problem to solve. Um, if we look at the OpenStack universe, um, it's a bit harder. I mean, it's not like one big public cloud that uh, is the, the reference for everything else, but uh, there's many. There's um, a few public clouds uh, out there and many private cloud installations uh, based on OpenStack. And if you've done an OpenStack installation, one thing you um, learn pretty quickly is there's a lot of choices you have. There's a lot of configuration options, a lot of uh, design um, patterns that you can follow to adapt OpenStack to meet your specific needs. And I think that's, that's great because it's a really one of the advantages that OpenStack has. It has this great adaptability to, so you can adjust it to exactly the needs that you have and fulfill those. Um, at the same time, it makes this whole interrupt story somewhat harder. So if you look at some of the uh, users that we have and uh, when, what, what they are using, what they expect, as you see a lot of them are using more than one OpenStack public cloud. Maybe they have an internal one um, they've built up just for development purposes. And now they maybe want to go in production and then they've taken a decision, okay, well, let's maybe do production in a public cloud. And of course, the expectation is the applications they've built, the automation they've written, all can be transferred to that public cloud and just works. Um, and that's one of the problems we are, we need to work on to make sure that actually that is the case. Um, or maybe if it's not, if it's not the case, at least it's easy to see why this is not the case and what kind of um, the challenges there are, so at least to make it transparent. And then, of course, there's also people that are using multiple private clouds, um, maybe from different vendors, maybe from the same vendor. Um, and um, that makes the problem, of course, then even a bit harder. So the, I think for us as a community, it's important that we understand that challenge and 
uh, try to, to manage this. So I think we have this, this great uh, freedom of having the choices that OpenStack gives you. We have literally thousands of possibilities to configure all your services. Um, maybe not all of those combinations make sense, but there's still, still plenty of them. And that, that freedom is important to our, to our community and to us. It's, I think it's one of the values we actually have um, as a community um, to drive this forward. At the same time, we need to make sure that um, we don't break the, break the expectations. So you could imagine really that there's a very, very fragmented community, everybody doing his own thing, um, forking here and there, um, creating very strange configurations for very specific needs, and then um, the expectations that people have, you can use an application that you've written for one version of your public cloud installation and move it to another one. Um, will just not work anymore. So that's kind of the anarchy that we need to, to avoid. Um, the other option, of course, is we kind of understand this and we come up with a menu of well understood choices. I use the, I, I use the hamburger picture to kind of um, did, did do this. And what this actually means is, I mean, a hamburger is a hamburger. You know what to expect. There's some bread in there. And there's some, some pieces you can select. And there are still a, there's still a lot of choices, but they still have something in common and you understand what the things in common are and you understand what the choices are and you have some visibility and then can take the choice. So this is some of the things we hear from our customers, um, the kind of questions they come and confront us with. Um, they go through cloud transformation. So a lot of our customers um, are really in a ra rather early phase of that. They, they understand they need to rewrite their applications, make sure they match this um, paradigm of being scale out, um, of being possible to, to well, of, of really being, being suitable to run on the cloud. But of course, that investment, they want to know, okay, what platform should we choose? How can we make this future proof? So that's one of the, the questions they ask us. And uh, of course, we as an OpenStack community should give them a good answer to that. Um, people challenge enterprise readiness by just looking at this uh, large, um, this variety of vendors that are involved in the OpenStack ecosystem at the variety of, of projects in the big tent. Um, and they say, well, this, this is chaotic. I mean, this cannot possibly be enterprise ready. Um, so we need to, to work on bringing some order into that. Um, a number of our customers, they really look into cloud bursting scenarios. So they have set up their own uh, OpenStack private cloud. Um, but they don't, well, I mean, they don't want to run into the same capacity over provisioning uh, that they have been done on the legacy infrastructure. So they, they really want to have the ability to say, okay, well, let's, let's do some private cloud because we need it, but let's make sure if there's bursts in load, we can use a cloud bursting mode and use some public cloud that then will handle those load peaks for us. Um, and then ultimately, of course, there's application and tool developers that want to know, um, I have a specific application, I have a tool written, and I have used um, certain implementation of OpenStack to develop against. I know it works there. How can I know whether it works on the more broad um, OpenStack ecosystem? How do the other OpenStack-based clouds look like? Does that tool work there? And they want to know some, some answer to the question. Um, so what we want to um, do, it's the goal really of this interoperability effort that is underway in the community. Um, we want to make sure we have standards that we can measure against. Um, and what we have today, of course, is the interop guidelines uh, for that. Um, then we want to make it easy to test against those standards. Um, the RevStack client helps with that. And what we also want uh, is then to have a place where we can collect and publish the results. Uh, so we provide this transparency also to the people that want to have that information. They don't need to do that testing all on their own to find out. And that's where the RevStack server helps with. I'll hand over to, to Kathy. Okay, thank you, Kurt. So, um, what I will talk about next is what has the OpenStack uh, community has been doing um, to address these three uh, areas. So, um, pretty much in the fall of 2013, um, the... Next. No, doesn't work. Good. Okay. The OpenStack um, um, Foundation Board has found a, uh, a DevCore committee um, 
to work on the uh, formalized the uh, uh, definition of uh, interop uh, guidelines. That is the area that the uh, open science community is trying to address the uh, 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 measurable standard um, area. The, in the beginning of this year, the DEFCO committee was renamed as the Interop Working Group. So the primary um, responsibility of this group is to define the interoperability guidelines. So what does a interoperability guideline consist of? So the guideline defines um, uh, capabilities that must be present as part of the product APIs. And the ways to test the presence of these capabilities is by a set of the must pass test. And not, not only uh, um, the guideline uh, define capabilities, it also define designated sectors that are the OpenStack code that must be present in the product. Oh my God. <laughs> so complying with these guidelines is required to qualify for OpenStack power trademark for public, private, and distribution clouds since the beginning of 2015. So with, now with the uh, 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 guidelines that we have already defined, we need a set of tools uh, so that the, uh, it can be used to test the clouds. And once the, we have the test results, we need a set of tools so that um, we can uh, upload this result to a centralized repository and share that with the community. For that purpose, a... Um, One or two next. Uh, the RevStack uh, project was formed. Okay, so the RevStack project is actually have two parts the RevStack clients and the RevStack servers. The primary responsibility and goal of the RevStack client is for testing. How do we have a tools that enable the user uh, to test seamlessly, um, trying to uh, uh, make it as easy as possible? Do we get there yet? Maybe not completely there today, but that is the primary goal of the RevStack clients. And once the test results are collected, um, um, the RevStack server uh, is a set of tools that can be used to set up a, a RevStack server and that uh, serve as the, a centralized repository for user to upload their result to. And also it provides a UI for the user to check their result against the various guidelines. Both the RevStack client and the RevStack server can be installed on premise at the vendor location so that they can uh, check their uh, uh, um, uh, test result before upload it to a, a public uh, uh, repository. So a little bit more information about RevStack clients. And uh, RevStack client is a command line tool. As we say earlier, um, uh, the user can just install that on premise and test the cloud in house. And currently, the RevStack uh, um, client is based on Tempest test suite. There could be uh, um, other extension later, but currently, that is the underlying test suite that we used. And because it is a Tempest test suite, uh, RevStack clients will install a default uh, Tempest version at, that the RevStack um, team has been verified um, at, the uh, at the time that the uh, Interop working group working on the guideline, we use that Tempest to verify that and that serves as our default uh, Tempest version. And of course, the user can use any Tempest version to test uh, um, in-house or to run their test. But a word of caution is 
as any project, the Tempest project is very dynamic. There's a lot of update and change to the project. And if, if the user is running uh, using a Tempest version that is not the default version, um, there are occasions that you will see some uh, uh, issue because of the code discrepancy. And when that happens, uh, we encourage the user to uh, 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 create a bug or in, the, uh, in the storyboard to both the inter-off uh, working group storyboard and the ref stack storyboard. And then we can work together with the community to see what is the uh, action that should be taken. Um, there may be uh, a need to update the guidelines. So once we have the results, now we can uh, upload the result. And the result uh, uh, is in, uh, for RefStack is in the JSON format. And it can be uh, uploaded uh, uh, anonymously or with the signature. So earlier we talked about the RefStack server. For the official OpenStack Power uh, uh, Trademark Program, the official data will be uh, uh, uploaded to a RefStack server that was built in the OpenStack infrastructure environment. And on the screen here, you see that uh, URL. And if you, are, uh, you have a computer and you are able to get to that URL, um, we can look at uh, some of the features that provide by this um, uh, website uh, together. So with now, I'm going to switch to the websites. So what you see here is the RefDAC website. Um, on the tab here, one of the tab, uh, the OpenStack Power Guidelines. So here is where you can see the guidelines. The interop working group define the guideline in JSON format. The um, RefDAC UI just present that in a form that it will be easier for visualization. So if you click on the uh, version uh, drop-down tab here, you will see all the guidelines that has been uh, published by the Interop Working Group so far. So the first one that we published is in 2015-03. And the latest one is 2017-01. And on any times, there will always be two active uh, guidelines that uh, the user should be test again. And these guidelines will be uh, denoted by a um, guideline status of approved. So you can see that uh, guideline 2017-01 having the status of approved approved, and 2016-08 uh, um, um, also have a status of approved. But then when you go to 2016-01, the status here is superseded. That means that this is a previous uh, guideline that is no longer in effect, and any test should not be tested against this guideline. As we talked earlier, guideline um, uh, will have uh, uh, capabilities. And in this guideline, 2017-01, the capability will be listing here. So the first capability list, listing here is a compute image create. And the next one is compute instant action get, et cetera. We're also saying that uh, capability uh, is measured by a set of must-pass tests. And here is the set of the must-pass test. So now that we have a guideline, how do we check the result of our test against the guideline? So let's click on the community result tab. And just click on any, any uh, result set, for example, if I click on this one, 
And you will see that this test result was uploaded on uh, May 9. And you will see the number of past tests here is 1,445. 1,345, and um, this is a very good user who tests the entire API test and not just the uh, uh, must pass test, and that's what we highly recommend it, that whenever testing, if it's possible, if you test the entire uh, API test, it will give us a lot of data which will be used to, for the interop working group to define the next uh, guidelines. And for this set of test results, if we check against guideline 2017-01, you will see the big screen, uh, green uh, square with a yes inside, uh, indicate that this test set have passed the requirement of this guideline. So you can also uh, check the result again, a different guideline, um, et cetera. So, uh, that is what has been done so far um, um, for uh, uh, interop transparency. And I will test, pass it to Chris to talk about what will be done in the future. So right now, the OpenStack Powered Program has three different trademarks. Um, we have, and, and they're all um, roughly based on the same guidelines. We have the OpenStack powered storage, which is, which is OpenStack Swift, it's object storage. We have OpenStack powered compute, which includes what you would um, consider to be kind of the classic integrated projects. That would be um, uh, Keystone, Nova, Cinder, um, Neutron, Glance, right? You know, so all of your compute networking and storage. And then we have the OpenStack Powered Platform, which is a combination of the first two trademark programs. It's OpenStack Powered Storage and OpenStack Powered Compute together, so you're adding um, object storage Swift to your, um, to, your, to your system. And as Catherine mentioned, um, this, these programs have been in effect for a couple years now. Um, you know, we're, we're coming up on our third year. We've um, done a lot of iteration on them, and we've kind of hit the point where those programs have stabilized. We've added all the capabilities that are essentially going to be there. There's not going to be a lot of change. But there's been a lot of demand from, um, you know, from within the community for being able to identify different classifications of interoperability. Um, and this leads us to a question of how should we be, how should we be expanding the OpenStack powered trademark program? Um, should there be new major programs? For example, um, NFV is a very large use case within the community. And um, is there a space to be able to add a new program where we can talk about capabilities that are specific for NFV and attaching a trademark program to that? But there are also a lot of individual projects within, the, w w within OpenStack. And, do we, and as you've seen in the keynotes and in a lot of the discuss discussions this week, there's a question of do we want to take programs like Cinder and make those standalone. And if we do that, do we also want to, to apply an independent uh, major program trademark to that? But finally, we do have this OpenStack powered compute and storage and platform. And there are a number of different projects that integrate on top of that platform. For example, heat orchestration could be one of those projects. And do you want to be able to say that you have an OpenStack powered cloud that, in that has an extension of orchestration or has an extension of, say, database. So this is something that we presented to the board, to the board of directors um, over the last weekend, and they're pretty excited about that. And for the last few months and in the upcoming months, we're working on a new version of the interop guidelines, so the interop guidelines version 2.0. And there are a few new features that are going to be added to this that we're pretty excited about. Uh, the first is allowing ma new major programs. And so going back to the NFV example, having a new OpenStack powered NFV that can be applied across the industry to say that this cloud is ready to support NFV workloads. Um, also adding program extensions um, where you can specify dependencies. Um, so you can say that um, orchestration could depend upon um, the existence of compute and networking and storage, um, or the same with database. Um, but 
in, in a lot of ways, the programs mostly stay the same. We're going to identify capabilities. These are the, and these capabilities are identified with tests, and so that users have a way to check an existing cloud to make sure that it does meet the capabilities they need for their workload. Um, but also designated sections with code to be able to identify that products that we call OpenStack are indeed OpenStack. These guidelines are going to be community driven. We're encouraging all of the stakeholders to build their own guidelines and to work with us on building those guidelines. So we have a strong relationship with the NFV community and we're actively working on building a guideline for them. We've also gone to the project PTLs, um, the HEAT PTLs, Trove, um, Designate for DNS. And they're working with us to build out the new set of capabilities for their vertical and extension projects. Now, the Interop Working Group will maintain control of the official uh, trademark eligible guidelines. These are going to be developed um, in conjunction with the TC and approved by the, bo by the board of directors. But our ultimate goal is throughout the community is to have projects, project owners in general define the minimums for interoperability and allow them to publish them so even if they aren't part of an official OpenStack powered trademark program, users will still be able to go and determine if, if cloud products are compliant with the interoperability guidelines established by the community. So, I've talked about a few programs. Um, proposed platforms for 2018 are NFV. Um, there's also been a lot of discussion about adding new platforms that capture just individual projects. And so it's conceivable that we could have a new Cinder vertical platform for block storage or Keystone for identity. Um, you, know, these are, you know, these are things that have been um, a tremendous amount of interest has been expressed by the community. And it's something that we're looking at adding, um, you know, and you know, releasing in 2018. We also have a number of proposed extensions. These are trademarks that are going to be applied to existing OpenStack-powered clouds. Um, so there are a bunch of them. We have for DNS, we have Designate orchestration includes Heat, um, Secrets Barbican, Container Orchestration Magnum. Um, database Trove and uh, Big Data Sahara. These are just some of the programs that we're looking at adding um, extensions onto existing OpenStack powered products. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Catherine and she can describe how RefStack is going to integrate with these new extensions and programs. Right. So, um, as you see, so far, all the guideline is one type of guideline is the uh, um, OpenStack Powered Guideline. Going forward, since we are enable user to define their own guideline, what we call custom guideline, um, in an effort to uh, 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 um, giving a framework for people to define their own uh, inter uh, um, criteria, and also with the hope that it will be all testing in on-premise and feedback to the foundation and the working group and maybe make that become an official one later. But with that, um, the rep stack uh, will be able, will be, will have to update to host guideline other than the OpenStack Power guideline. And um, uh, there is uh, work to do in the future, but uh, the goal is being able to host uh, the customer guideline, um, and not only hosting the uh, uh, customized guideline and being able to accept uh, test result that may not be tempest based in the future. So that is the future work for RevStack. I'll turn over to Kurt. Okay, so <clears throat> maybe I take the, the last slides to, to close this and look a bit how this could look like in the future. I mean, what you see here, uh, the two large black boxes kind of um, uh, represent the, the currently existing uh, interop guideline programs, um, the OpenStack Powered Compute and Object Storage, and of course the, the platform is the superset of those two. And uh, we're looking into covering uh, additional services like orchestration or designate, or maybe bare metal, I think we've, we've heard that request as well in the, in the mm -hmm. discussion uh, yeah. the, other, the other night. Um, and then, of course, there's also another thing that we um, uh, do is over the time, the, um, 
the, the amount of interfaces and capabilities that are covered are expanding. I mean, you said we've reached a mostly stable uh, state there, but I mean, as the services expand, of course, we will adapt and uh, uh, cover more of the API um, functionality that those services offer. Um, what I put on there was two yellow boxes, so we could imagine there's like a specific um, um, guidelines or specific um, test sets where you cover very specific um, functions like uh, you want to use uh, image management and you know in my cloud uh, I can only consume certain image formats and you want to test against that. So it's possible to create these as well with the framework that's currently being worked on. Um, so this is how like a, a new vertical program could look like. Um, it's I think at this point not completely clear yet whether it would be a superset of the currently existing OpenStack uh, compute or maybe there are some pieces yeah, well, well, so so the, the the output from the from the from the board meeting was that a vertical program like this would not necessarily cover all the capabilities that existed inside of the existing programs, but it would not be um, incompatible with existing programs. Yeah. And so NFV may not have all of the capabilities inside of an OpenStack Power Cloud, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't have any capabilities that were in direct contradiction to the existing capabilities. Yeah. In those I mean that would be yeah that would be stupid honestly. Yeah. I mean to to, to have yeah. such contradictions, yeah. I mean, of course, it should be possible for somebody to certify against both guidelines and have yep. both at the same time in yes. one cloud. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions we, we got asked by our customers early on, and we had a bubble on, I mean, how can we make sure my tool or my application works on the OpenStack cloud? So what this custom profile um, work that's, being, uh, that's currently ongoing, Sorry for the German. <laughs> um, the, what this work would enable customers to do is actually create their own profiles. Um, so what they could do is that they could identify what is it my application does require, um, look at the existing Tempest test that exists uh, that cover those things. Maybe um, it's also a nice opportunity to contribute to Tempest, some new tests to cover the uh, things that you have discovered that are not yet covered. Yeah. And, and, and one example of this, this is, a, this is a common request that we've gotten from a lot of uh, members in the industry, is they want to be able to sell, uh, provide a cloud that is compatible with um, Amazon through the EC2 APIs. And so it's conceivable that a vendor would, would, would create an EC2 compliance profile, um, and then they would be able to determine that um, their clouds work to not only against an OpenStack cloud, but also possibly against, say, an Amazon cloud. Yeah. I mean, obviously, creating those custom profiles, that, that there's a bit of work involved there. Um, I think the first, maybe the most difficult piece is understand exactly what the application and tool needs in terms of uh, supported API calls, but also in terms of expected behavior um, that might be uh, um, less obvious than maybe the API calls themselves. And then, of course, create those tests, um, use the ones that are already existing, create the list of tests, and then um, uh, create your custom profile. Um, the way I imagine this uh, to evolve is that uh, once we have enabled um, people, customers to upload profiles um, to the RevStack site to test their cloud against, we were thinking about adding some sharing possibilities. So I have created a profile, I make it visible to somebody else. I want to yeah. use this to test against. Um, of course, um, the next step, and that's something we need to discuss carefully, is um, Maybe we should also allow people to make this publicly visible. Say, well, I have here this nice profile. Uh, the, um, the thing that makes it a bit difficult, I upload a profile, call it Terraform profile. And then everybody, of course, that sees this has the expectation, if I use this, this, mm -hmm. is, this has a meaning. So there needs to be some kind of quality assessment and curation process to make sure if something is then officially shared with everybody, there's a certain amount of quality in there and uh, the tests are meaningful. Uh, so it, it adds value as opposed to just confusing everybody. And that's something we still need to, to define and decide how we do this best. Of course, one of the things that will also happen is if we have a lot of uh, custom profiles and they meet the, the quality criteria that we have, we use this as input to um, then also have discussions about uh, could they be part of one of the future trademark guidelines. So this is kind of the, the process that we imagine. We want to enable just a larger um, and a more diverse set of people to contribute to the to the interop um, transparency this way. So that's kind of the, the, the goal we are, we're heading towards. Yep. Good, I think that's what we wanted to show you. Um, definitely, we would appreciate to get some help um, 
by getting your feedback, questions right now or afterwards. Um, you can talk to us, people that you, you see in the, the Interop Working Group and the, the RepStack project. Um, yeah. are, there, are there any questions? Does anybody have questions about the, the programs? So aside the very, very good uh, technical aspects of the entire program and the process-wise, which, which uh, I would highly appreciate, um, I think there is another component which is even more important, which is uh, how do we communicate this plan and, and the content of that in a form to the community and to the market that customer can rely on decisions on that one. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, this RevStack site is um, a tool, but this is yet, as it is built up, not, not the appropriate platform for any kind of transparency in the sense not uh, the e each and every single feature, which is subject of a test case, yeah. but rather the entire story. What belongs to an OpenStack standard version 1, 2017? Which function needs to be supported in which form in, on, a, on a higher abstraction level? Is there planned any, let me say, work stream as part of your working group to address it? Appropriate. May, may I start, uh, Chris, and you can maybe <laughs> then amend. I mean, one thing, of course, is if you qualify for the open uh, stack power trademarks, you get, you get the listing in the marketplace. So there is some visibility we provide to this by having the trademark and incenting vendors and service providers to actually be listed on the marketplace. But I mean, what I hear you saying is also that may not be enough, and we need to work more. Uh, Chris, maybe you. Yeah, yeah. So we, so the, so, so yeah. As Kurt mentioned, the open stack marketplace is where most of this transparency happens. Um, we, for for any for any public cloud, private cloud, or distribution that passes these guidelines, they receive a mark that states the exact guidelines that they pass. Um, we're in the process of adding links back to RefStack so that you can actually see a listing of the capabilities that are being provided by those clouds. Um, you know, there, we also have um, the OpenStack uh, brand page also, and the interop page talks about how the interoperability program works um, and includes information on the capabilities that are being provided. Um, so, but that is something that we can, you know, that I think that we can um, have a stronger message about. And I think that in the coming year, we're actually going to be, um, you know, expressing that more through, you know, as these, as these come online. Um, to the community, through the mailing lists, um, through marketing materials, um, through communications um, to the board and to vendors directly. Um, but uh, yet, as this program grows out, we're actually um, going to be using it in, another, in a number of other initiatives to express how OpenStack just isn't a, a single monolithic thing that you have to pull in all of the pieces, but that it's actually composable infrastructure and that you're able to, to take the capabilities you want and verify that those, capa that those capabilities exist for your installation. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions, remarks? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Roman, I work for Mirantis. I have many questions, do you want me to ask here or do you want me to come over and ask them later? Because I have like five questions. Um, we, we have like one or two more minutes, I guess. Uh, I see, okay. So then I will start with important. So how this is different from Tempest? Okay, Tempest is a functional test suite. You limited the amount of tests which you do to what you think is important, but what you think is important might be different for different clients, exactly. So one client doesn't really care about object storage and maybe even doesn't, mm -hmm. or doesn't care about the block storage, mm -hmm. it doesn't have it. I mean, how this is all meshes up and how it is different from Tempest? So, um, so Tempest is a fully functional test suite mm -hmm. that covers the entire API, both um, administrator and non-administrator tests. One of the goals behind the interoperability program is that it's user targeted. And so you as a user show up, you don't have administrator access to a cloud. You, you, you have user access to it. And so there are certain actions that you want to perform. So we are taking a subset of Tempest and verifying that user actions can be accomplished. And so that's, so, so currently the interoperability tests are a small subset of the functional tests. The goal being that you're able to test basic actions, but that you can also have a trust but verify model where a vendor comes to us and says, we've tested our cloud, we pass all of the, all of the required tests and we qualify for the certification, but you as a user can show up, run those exact same tests, 
and make certain that those capabilities are available for you. But I mean, so you're saying that instead of, um, so this is not a vendor no. intended tool, this is more specifically user you yeah. know, tool which user can run and verify that whatever was yep. given to him is acceptable. Yes. Yep, and that's the reason why we provide a, a, a tool like RefStack client, because a lot of user probably don't know, I mean, for Tempest, um, there's a, not a lot of people know about that, and our effort is simplify that uh, test system so that any user, the final goal is any user pick up one installation and being able to, to test. Well, yeah, I mean, if every user would have to set up Tempest yeah, just yeah. to validate that the cloud works, that would be. But yeah, that, that <laughs> not is the very nice. main, main difference between Tempest test itself, where it tests pretty much a what I call a, a defined, well-defined uh, environment, where as a user, uh, it is testing a end-user cloud. Okay, I still have certain doubts, but let's go with that, okay. So the next one is, do you guys plan to add performance testing? Because what we found is it's super important not only to make sure that API work, but they work at a certain level and certain specific actions are you know, done within a reasonable amount of time because otherwise it just all becomes a mess. Right. So performance testing is outside of the scope of yeah. this project. Um, it, it's um, it's for, for, a number of, for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, there, you know, but it's, it's, it's not outside of the scope of the future programs, especially, you know, things where performance actually matters, like in an FB cloud, network performance matters. You need, you need to have a certain, you know, you need to measure a certain level of latency. And so while in the current projects and in more of the basic projects, we're not going to be doing performance testing, we could see specific cases where when you're, when, when we're, when you're testing for a particular type of application, that scenario and performance tests are admitted as part of the test suite. I think you should, not, not that I'm making a recommendation, but I'm just making a general statement. Please consider this because for many applications, it is absolutely critical. So for example, yesterday, Ontario Institute of Cancer Research, they were talking about uh, being large files being written and uh, you know, mm -hmm. read from a storage without any performance testing. This really doesn't fly for them for, for the reason that they just yeah. can't yeah. do their work. Yeah, it's, I mean, uh, I, I'm, so for for so there are tools like Rally that will do performance testing, and um, if a client needs those tools, they exist and they're available. Um, right now, it's just out, out, out within the scope of applying a trademark to a product. Performance testing falls outside of the scope of that. Uh, that's okay. So you are saying that it's more kind of trademarking and get the stamp type of program versus well, it's to guarantee all, it, it, all the, encompassing the, testing to make sure right, that all APIs work and right. The the trademark is a guarantee of a base level of interoperability. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can add more onto that. There's not. It's not. It's not exclusive of saying that. You, you know that. I mean that becomes a vendor marketing point that you have the fastest cloud. Huh? And you can demonstrate that, um, but that's outside of the scope of the of the interoperability and trademark program. But, but we also can see that um, this is pretty much the base layer. If if you don't even pass this play right. layer, forget about, about performance. Yeah, 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 so so that's yeah. a very very basic base yeah. layer. Okay, yeah. two small questions. Do I have time sure. for them? Um, oh, oh. Do we have time to take the last questions? Yeah. I Okay, so you mentioned other projects, and this is super important because, again, some of the projects uh, expect, you know, designate to be there. Some of them do not. Yes. Some of them expect throw. Uh, how you, how you planning to deal with these different right. aspects, given mm -hmm. the fact that number of projects which people can expect is various? Are you going to create a different baseline saying, so, let me finish, baseline saying this is, uh, I don't know, this is big data type of application, so these capabilities needs to be, are you going to introduce different profiles for different type of workloads, or how it's going to be handled? Right, so, so we've described the vertical programs, mm -hmm. and um, so one that we have today, OpenStack powered platform, would be one of those vertical programs. If you need something like Sahara for big data, you would call that OpenStack powered platform with 
big data. Capabilities. Yeah, and so and, and so and so the and so and so we're calling these extension programs. The extension programs will have dependencies that are required. So, um, you know, DNS would require networking, and so any vertical program that had a networking component could attach the the DNS extension to it. But do you see that it's slowly morphing into all-encompassing Tempest test? Uh, it's extension is. No, yeah, I mean if you if you want to have all the possible um, yeah. trademarks in the future, maybe then you have most most of Tempest covered, right? Yep. Uh, but it's still a choice. I mean, some customers will have limited use cases, and that's valid. But it's not. But it's not. I mean, when you when you say all of Tempest, it's not it's not pulling in all of Tempest. We're actually looking at um, the the non-admin APIs that are checking for the capabilities that are required for a user to have a base level of interoperability. And so right now there are thousands of, there's what, there's how many thousand, how many tests are in Tempest? 2,000? Uh, yeah. yeah, roughly 2,000 tests. The current OpenStack powered platform only checks about 230, I think. Yes. So, so it's, a, it's a, you know, we're only checking 10% of Tempest. It's gonna be the same across the other projects. There are lots of functional tests that are going very deep into all of the APIs, but when you whittle that down to the user-facing APIs, that set becomes a lot smaller. Okay, okay. so uh, just a comment before next question. So it, we found that it's, it's important to use a very higher level type of actions mm -hmm. uh, instead of going to actually check API by API. So for example, the action saying that you know, create, compute, attach the storage and yeah, run yeah. something and it, you know, covers majority of whatever, you know, user yeah. expects. So I'm just uh, yeah. making a comment saying that, the, you know, the higher you go up the level, right. the, the stack, the less actions you need to do to check all the functionality. Yeah. And, 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 and that's like, like, so scenario tests, again, they fall outside of the scope of what we're trying to accomplish, but we actually, um, if everybody who went to the keynote saw the interop challenge. Yeah. Um, and that's actually an upstream project within OpenStack that is essentially scenario tests against OpenStack clouds. And if you're interested in application scenario testing, that's a great repository to start from. If you're looking for scenario testing, things like Rally provides, you can also do that. Again, we're not exclusive of anything like that, and there are other projects out there that can help you, um, you know, do. Uh, you know, more stress testing against your cloud and make sure that, um, you know, it's really going to run the application workload you want. Yep. Okay. We should. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. And I have Thank a you. really, really last question. So if you can scroll to the page where you had a yeah, certification I, result, it says accept flagged tests. And I have a question, what accept. is accept flagged tests? Uh, so a flag test, so, so, so in, the, in the course of building these guidelines, we make mistakes um, or things change. Uh -huh. and. Sometimes we identify tests that, um, for some reason, should not be in the program. So an example of this is um, there's, there's a capability for image attach that is in the Nova API and is also in the Cinder API. Um, the Nova API test is the one we want because that, is, um, that performs the entire task of um, attaching that API. The Cinder API, is actually a helper for the Nova API. Um, so one is implicitly guaranteed by the other, but that API may not want to be made public in a cloud. And so, but we were checking for that capability. And so it's in the current guidelines. We, we, we came at the interoperability working group came to the conclusion that that test actually shouldn't be there anymore. And so we flagged it. So the test is still part of the guideline. It's a board approved guideline. It can't be changed but we no longer require it for, for um, compatibility testing. And so any test that has been flagged within the current guidelines is not required to be passed. And, and another quick example is as Tempest changed, sometimes test name changed, and then the old test result that upload doesn't have that test. So the, the, the correct thing in this scenario is flag that test and add the new test to the new guideline. Yeah. So, so that is a way to uh, update, to make update to a approved guideline. Yeah, it's a, it's a safety valve for users and vendors. It's an understanding that um, our knowledge is broad and not necessarily deep. Um, and sometimes we, uncover, sometimes we uncover things in the wild and it's a way for us to identify those problems and um, change them now, um, but also you know, you know, without having to wait for the future. Mm -hmm. 
you know, to be able to address them. Very good. Thank you. Right. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks.